Hello, hello, this is Jonathan and you're listening to the Johnny Talks Podcast, the place where we help you achieve your financial goals. Hello friends, hope you're having a great day wherever you are, whether that's in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, Nashville or Hamburg, Germany. And if you're a new listener to the show, I want to give you a special warm welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And if you're a returning listener, thanks so much. Great to have you back. In today's episode, we will speak to my friend Adina. Adina is from the Netherlands and we met last September at FinCon. Although we met at a money slash finance conference, one of her favorite topics is money mindset, a topic I really enjoy because, in my opinion, that is where it all starts. For those who have been around, I have now been blogging and talking about personal finance for the last three and a half years. And to be honest, the money mindset part is not something I thought about in the beginning. And if you think about it, it's true. You can write or read about the best financial tips, the next best stock with the highest potential growth, the best area in town to own a rental property and so on. But if you do not have the correct money mindset in the first place, you will always be struggling in a way or another. And today... Adina will give some practical tips on how to transform your money mindset. She will also share her financial journey, including some of the errors she made in the past, so you can avoid making them as well. And she will also illustrate how she developed her mindset through these struggles. This episode is for you if you are currently struggling with your finances, have developed negative emotions towards money over the years and want to see a change. And the good news is, it is possible to change your attitude towards your finances. So without further ado... Let's hear the interview. Hey Adine, how gaat het vandaag? Ja, hartstikke goed. Leuk dat ik hier ben. Oh, well, wait, Adine, we need to do it in English uh, for the audience. So, uh, <laughs> how are you doing today, Adine? I'm doing fine. It's early morning and it's the uh, start of a great new day. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, I made a stupid, silly joke, but it's uh, Adine and I, we speak Dutch because Adine is from the Netherlands and Dutch is my second language. So that's how we usually converse. And Adina is here on the show because we want to talk about money mindset. Uh, she runs. A, she has been running a blog on personal finances, lekkerlevenmetminder.nl, which means live well with less. Yes. And she talks about money topics and money mindset. And today uh, I invited Adina uh, to talk about money mindset. So uh, Adina, what is a money mindset. I mean, how do people get a money mindset? Well, the money mindset is like a regular mindset. It's it's about how you see things, how you perceive things, and how you feel about them. Mm-hmm. And then in this case, it's really about the, the money thing. So it's kind of the attitude you have towards your finances. And some people have a very negative attitude toward finances. They think it's boring or it's uh, difficult. And other people are more of the type like, well, there's there's always enough for everybody and you can see that the people with more of a scarcity mindset uh, they tend to have less money and they tend to run into money problems while the other people with the more of an abundance mindset um, well they seem to keep on getting richer so it's, it's kind of interesting it's it's what people say well the poor the, the poorer people are getting more poor and richer people are getting richer but that's well, that could actually be very well true because of the mindset difference. Yes, correct. And um, as well, one of the things I discovered, I've been blogging for less time than you. And first I was blogging about technical, I mean, not technical stuff, but uh, like budgeting and tips on finance and investing. And this is all fun and, and games. But what I discovered as well, because I was getting more deep into the money topics, is that it all starts with the mindset to me. Yeah, and that's also the only way you can keep up because you can save only that much money and you can cut only that many things from your budget. But at a certain point, it just it just gets very annoying or tiring or you, you kind of can get depressed because there's nothing you can do since you have to save the money. But if you start with the mindset and you create a great mindset, then first of all, money comes flowing to you. So uh, you don't have to be so... Um, well, spastic about money mm-hmm. anymore. And second of all, uh, you will perceive it in a very different way. So it's it's not about saving money and having nothing. It's just about creating uh, more space for what you want and then spending your money on the things you actually find important, which would also bring more joy and fulfillment. 
Mm -hmm. And you created this course, uh, Money Mindset, which we can uh, touch um, upon later on. Yes. Are you teaching then people to get an abundance mindset? Is that what you're trying to achieve with this uh, with this course? Well, I'm I'm actually focusing on the combination. So it's for me, it's money mindset, but it's also practical knowledge about what you can do with your money. Because if you don't know uh, how you can use it to work for you, for example, or if you don't know um, what you can do to create more wealth, then it doesn't work. You have to have the mindset, but you also have to know what to do with it. So I'm combining practical knowledge, for example, on paying off your mortgage or investing with the more spiritual uh, topic of money mindset. Yeah. And of course, that focuses on mostly on abundance, gratitude, and all those principles that well, will really um, enforce a great money mindset. Yeah. And uh, Adi, you're from the Netherlands. I'm from Belgium. And actually, we met at FinCon. I, I didn't say that, but we, we actually met uh, in Washington. Yes. And do you think there's a general cultural trends? I mean, sorry, not trends, uh, cultural differences uh, between uh, money mindsets in the Netherlands, in Belgium, where I'm from, and in the US? Do, do you see this? I mean, you've been blogging for 10 years. Maybe you, uh, and since you're in the topic, maybe you, you can see that easier than me. Well, I think there is um, there is kind of a difference because the Dutch people are very known for being frugal and saving money. And I think there's even this uh, saying, going Dutch, which <laughs> <laughs> which isn't very positive. But in, in Holland, it would be positive because each would pay their own way. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think most people are... Um, kind of frugal but that's that's from a scarcity mindset and i think in the us for example it i think people are a bit less frugal it's more of a credit card culture uh, but they also have a lot of um keeping up with the joneses so it's it's not about scarcity there but it is it's also not really appreciating money because you just spend it uh to spend it and you you spend it to to project a certain image of yourself but you don't really focus on what's important to you so it's it's also an example of a bad money mindset it's just a different one mm -hmm. and in belgium okay it's a bit hard for me to tell because i'm not from the outside it's easier for me to to make jokes about the going dutch and things like this <laughs> in my first job i worked in it and i worked towards the dutch market so it was always a joke because it they always i mean every customer tried to get a deal uh, which is fine, but uh, actually I learned to negotiate quite well thanks to to Dutch people. So thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. I, I could learn a thing or two from you, I think. Yeah, but but it's true. It's it's really it was really interesting, um, an interesting job from that perspective and from my negotiation negotiation skills. And in in Belgium, okay, with the, there's different cultures, so I will not expand. But basically, it's the Flemish people since they speak the same language. They make jokes about Holland, about their stinginess, etc. Uh, which for Dutch people is like, no, I'm using my money better. It's uh, I'm trying to make the best out of my uh, uh, of my money. So that's uh, that's kind of funny. And regarding Americans, my view, or, and I've said that to a few uh, of our common friends, uh, it's that when you think about America, it's like, oh yeah, money is overflowing, or not people are rich, but people spend, people spend a bit, like you said, that the credit card thing. I mean, for us, at least in Europe, and I've lived in several countries, I don't see this credit card, uh, the debts of uh, 60,000 euros or something. And people uh, try to pay it down in three years because uh, they want to move on with their life. So I, I, I don't see this. And as well, it seemed to me that uh, when you are in America, people sp speak easier about money. <laughs> Uh, but that's an impression I have. Okay, we have uh, friends uh, from the FinCon community, but still, it's, uh, you know, even when I'm there and you talk something related to money, it, it felt like it, it's easier to talk about things and uh, people seem more open about it. And back to Belgium, I don't know, I think it's a little bit taboo as well. But for example, um, when I was looking for a job, I could easily ask uh, some of my best friends for their salaries because I was looking for a similar job as them in procurement. Uh, in general, people, uh, and I've talked about it on the blog, they have a brick in the stomach, which is typically Belgian. They like to buy their own home. They like to save a lot, but they're not very, in general, they're not really active in the stock markets. 
So it's a bit like we save, we save, we save, and it's a bit conservative, I would say. Yeah. I mean, people live well. It's, I think it's maybe a bit less uh, taboo than in Holland. So I think we're kind of okay, but it depends a bit with who you speak. But uh, I would say it's still conservative and there's still a, um, a lot of taboo around it. Yeah, it's, it's the same in Holland. It's kind of a very sensitive subject because I think um, a lot of people combine value with money. So if you have a lot of money, you must be very valuable. Or if you get paid a lot of money, mm -hmm. you must yeah, you must be very valuable to your boss. But if you would ask your colleague what he or she makes, oh, yeah. then you might have the problem that, well, he gets more. So is he more valuable? It's, it's, it's very difficult to talk about that here. And I think it depends on where you work. I mean, I, I do have, or where you live or what you do. I also have some friends who are very easy to talk to talk to about money but it's also more uh, like the fincon community or because i'm openly talking about yeah. this. <laughs> it's but easier, I, yeah i started blogging 10 years ago because no one was talking about it and i just well i wanted to talk about it but i i had no one to talk to about it so it's it's kind of uh i think belgium might even be a bit further on this than than Holland. Okay, maybe probably the only thing we're further than uh, yeah. Holland. <laughs> and fries. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and chocolate. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> very good, very good. And uh, But Adine, for example, if you have somebody coming, a reader of yours or a friend or somebody that you meet and you talk about money and you notice, okay, they speak from a scarcity perspective, how do you think such person should move that money mindset to get to go to an abundance or at least to have a like a practical mindset about money and not uh, and not always think hey i need to save i need to save i need to get this deal uh, etc i try to get to the why because mm -hmm. usually people want to um, save for a certain reason and it, it could be that for example when they were young they had no money at all and they couldn't buy new clothes and had to wear clothes from their sisters or brothers or something mm -hmm. so usually it comes from something like that And I, I try to do, uh, I try to have them do the work as much as possible. So, for example, I ask people to uh, think about money memories. So, what can they remember about money from their childhood? Because, well, we all know all problems start there with your parents. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then think about what that made them feel like and um, how it may have affected them then and how it affects them now. And usually... Uh, if you're really getting into this, you will find something. And even if it's just one thing, and then you can, well, you can see it through your eyes now. So being an adult and knowing certain things and seeing things in perspective, that really helps. And then usually people start with one thing or no, most of the time they start with, well, I don't have any issues with money. I don't have any limiting <laughs> beliefs. I have no problems at all. I just don't have any money because blah, blah, blah. So they usually start out with that. And then after a while, they, they find one story, for example. And then they start working on it. And then another one arises and another one arises. Because if you start working on this, then you will first have to um, eliminate the, like the really obvious layers. But once you uh, start attracting more money and start doing more with it, then you you go to another level. And then you can find, they say something like every level has its own devil or something. And it, it's kind of like that. You can go all the way up and then still find another limiting belief which you didn't know you had. So it's, it's not like it's one fix and then it's all done. Mm -hmm. But I usually start with a story, help them find the story. And once they have the story... They will kind of know what to do with it because they can look at it from another perspective. And I will also help them with the practical knowledge to actually do something with it. So if you think you're stupid and you can't invest, well, if you don't know anything about it, that might also that might almost be true. But if you know what to do with it and you can let go of the belief that you are stupid and can't invest, then you have a great combination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I see. And um, actually, you wrote something to me Um <clears throat> which is the opposite of scarcity. It's abundance, but it's too much abundance. Yeah. And in the way you formulated it, it says, yeah, but on the other hand, okay, you know, saving and all these things, it tells something about a scarcity mindset, and we just discussed this. But as well, when you have too much, or not too much, but hoarding money, saving for the sake of saving, 
it's also another type of scarcity. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I personally see money as some sort of energy, so it has to flow. And if you are saving it all the time and your focus is on saving, well, it, saving is in general a good thing because it means that you can uh, pay for more expensive things, for example, or you can um, well take care of yourself if, if something happens with your job. So saving isn't a bad thing, but if the focus is saving and you're just saving for the, for the sake of saving, then you're actually focusing on scarcity of you're focusing on the idea that the money might run out mm -hmm. and that you will have a problem. But, uh, and it will also make sure that, that you don't see money as a tool anymore, but it will become something much bigger and much more important. And I think it's very, it's very important to see money really as a tool and as some sort of energy. And I recently heard on a podcast, a uh, comparison with air you should actually see it as air. You're breathing it in all the time mm -hmm. and you're never wondering if there will be enough. And you're never, in taking a, you're never taking a very big breath because you think that next minute the air might run out if you're just walking down the street. So not when you're diving or something. <laughs> you might want to take a deep breath then. And we, we always see money as something that will run out, but it won't. It's not like if, if you have more, then I have less. It's if you have more then I might have more as well. It's, it's, it's all about that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a zero-sum game, as they say. No, no, it's not a zero-sum game. That's a great expression. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I like the, the image of the air. I never, heard, uh, I never heard of it in such a way because, yeah, what I said as well, I made an article where I say why I'm actually blogging about finance, what I'm talking about, personal finance, etc. So it's not about uh, getting abandoned and uh, drive Ferraris. I mean, if that's your thing, fine. Uh, it's yeah. it's more about lifestyle and how money can serve as a tool to your wishes to, to live a happy life in the end. Yeah, and if, if you're thinking again about the air, it's, it's not just breathing in, it's also the ease of breathing out. So it's also um, feeling free to let it go, which goes back to the saving. If you're only saving for the sake of saving, then you, you have a hard time letting the money go, which mm -hmm. also means that you might not be able to enjoy it or uh, you won't be able to do as much with it as you can. Because if you're only saving, I'm not sure how it's in Belgium or in the US, but in Holland, we almost have to pay interest to to save our money. So you could do a lot of other things with the money to make it work for you. But that's just a, a side note. But you also have to learn to let it go. So uh, breathe it in and let it go and, and do it in, well, I think most meditation people would say three or four seconds. So it's it's like really deliberating uh, deliberately doing that and not throwing it all away, but also not keeping it all. Yeah, I see. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, it, it reminds me of uh, uh, one of my podcast episodes with Andy Hill. Uh, we talk about um, paying down the mortgage, etc. So Andy and his wife, they paid their mortgage and now they have extra money. So He's uh, more uh, the analytical, more the money nerd guy in the family. I mean, he's the one podcasting about money in the end. And he says, uh, I said, oh, yeah, can you give us an example of how you dealt uh, with money, different money views in your marriage? And he said, well, I'm the more nerdy guy, etc. So I tend to keep the money or to try to make it work. And my wife, when we had this extra money after paying the mortgage, well, she wanted to get to, to start spending on some fun stuff or experiences. And he said, well, I, after some discussions, yeah, of course, uh, I have to let it go. And he also felt less stressed as well because he he enjoyed it. He enjoyed the experience that what money could give him. I mean, spending and relaxing a bit and trying to find a good compromise. Yeah. On how yeah. To, to deal it, with it. And uh, then, yeah, okay, he, he was happy. And then if you want to know more, you can listen to the episode. But basically, that's the idea that, yeah, relax it a bit money is there to to be spent as well so it's uh it's, it's trying to find the balance that works for you in the end huh? yeah and if you really want to feel abundant then you you can't just uh keep it in because you won't feel abundant if you're sitting on a big pile of money you will feel abundant if you have like well like we had this year we were able to visit fincon mm -hmm. because we were probably saving up and not spending everything on things that are not important to us and then we're at least i will speak for myself Going to FinCon is one of the things I am doing because 
I think it's important. I think it it's, uh, gives me a lot of inspiration. But it's also spending thousands of, of euros on a trip, uh, and which other people in, in my surroundings, for example, will never do because they either think they don't have the money or they will spend it on other things. But for me, this is valuable. And if I save money on things that don't matter to me, then I have money to spend on these kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now you, you touch uh, upon FinCon and okay, I wrote an article and my recap is kind of, yeah, is it worth it to go as a European to this FinCon because it's more focused on uh, Americans and uh, Canadians and actually really even more on US itself? Do you think it's even worth it to go as a European? Yeah, I think so. I already... <laughs> I already bought my ticket for next year. <laughs> yeah, and it was cheaper now as well, huh? <laughs> it, yeah, it was. It was much cheaper. So I thought I could all. I could always sell, sell it before I think yeah. for August or something. Uh, it is just so worth it because of all the knowledge. Um, if you are, I'm an entrepreneur, so I I like to create things. I have to market them. I I have to learn all kind of things about that. And uh, FinCon is just a great help about yeah how to to market what you know mm-hmm. uh, how. To, teach what you know and it's also great just talking to people it's yeah of course it's more about uh, the u.s and almost everyone who is there is from the u.s but that doesn't take anything away from the fact that it's it's a safe space to talk about money all the time uh, without people looking strange and you can learn (laughs) so much (laughs) so it's yeah i think it's definitely worth it Yeah, yeah absolutely and i combine it with a a visit to San Diego afterwards, so it, it, it's great. So I combine it with the holidays, and I uh, as well took the opportunity to buy my ticket for next year, which was a better, even better deal. So that, that's great. And um, yeah, if people want to know more, they can read as well. Uh, I think you wrote a review as well, and I wrote a review yeah. as well. So that's fine. I can link it up. And uh, Adina, okay, you have um, you're helping people with their money mindset, but what about you? I mean, did, did you always have uh, this? Uh, practical and abundance mindset? Well, uh, I don't think so. I've always known that I wasn't born to be poor, but uh, I I really wasn't doing a lot about it besides saving. But when I was 24, which was about 10 years ago, uh, I bought this huge farmhouse and it was doable financially, but it was also just very expensive. And then I think I lived there for about one year when the crisis, the financial crisis really hit hard Mm -hmm. and two of my major clients went bankrupt. So uh, I went You were already blogging at the time? No. uh, Yeah. Uh, No, I started blogging around that time because I needed someone to talk to about this stuff because when those clients went bankrupt, I started saving like crazy and I wanted to know more about financial stuff because I, I took out a mortgage and I did read a bit about it and I I did put down a a down payment Mm -hmm. so in my view I was kind of doing the sensible thing but then I noticed well I'm kind of when well the shit hits the fan (laughs) you know it's it's, you're kind of very vulnerable and and you find yourself in a position where well the bank can actually sell your house which is where you live it's it's the roof over your head and leave you with a, a pile of debt so I wanted to know more about it. And then I found out that there were not many people talking about it. And uh, even online, there weren't really a lot of people yeah, writing about it. So I started my own blog just as some sort of diary to uh, keep myself focused, but also to well, to see how other people were doing things. Because if I would write about it, then maybe people would at least respond. I started blogging about it. And uh, I also just went on a search for um, my own mortgage papers. I checked out what I actually signed for. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was horrible because at the end, I, I didn't know this, but at the end, uh, I signed for paying off the mortgage twice and still having uh, 200,000 euros in debt after 30 years. Oh, wow. And I didn't know about it. <laughs> okay. So if I didn't do anything. But I don't understand uh, how, how does that work? It would be an interest and because of, and the interest was kind of high at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, they told me I would uh, have to take out, a, it's a, a spar hypotheque, which is something where you save on the one hand and then after 30 years you will pay it all off. But I only had it for part of the mortgage. Ah, and okay. It would, it would also mean that I would have to 
uh, make a lot of money to get the highest tax deduction. Mm-hmm. But when your uh, well, when your job um, ends, or in my case, my two major clients went bankrupt, I didn't make that much money. So my tax deduction went down a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of that way. And I also had a part of the mortgage which would not be uh, paid off at all. It was just you only pay interest and then... And then well, at the end, you need to pay this uh, kind of uh, lump sum. Yeah. Okay, or you wow. have to try to get a new mortgage. But if you're like 60 or 70 by then, then no one will give you a mortgage. No one in the right mind. It's a, it's, it's a bit sneaky system. I mean. Yeah. But is that still today like this in Holland? Or was it just at the time it was this thing and you didn't do your proper research by inexperience, which is fine, huh? Well, at the time, it was really the big, the big thing, and they said it was the most safe way to do it because you are saving, and then you you would get you would pay interest, but you would get the same kind of interest, the same amount, or not the same amount, but the same percentage, on uh, the money you saved. So it looked like a lot, but if you're paying, uh, you wouldn't pay anything off. So I would be paying six percent on two hundred thousand euros, mm-hmm. and at the at the same time, I would get the the six percent on the one hundred euros oh. and we'll save every month yeah yeah okay yeah so that, that's kind of the difference and they they presented it as the safest system and it was very popular at the time and it was after the interest only mortgage so the, there was some improvement and it, it was kind of the best thing to do they said mm-hmm. but i think if um well everybody did it at the time so i think on the one hand it was kind of uh maybe lack of proper research um on the other hand It was really, when I started writing about it, a lot of people even uh, said, a lot of people are still saying that it's the best type of mortgage. So it's, well, it's it's still a bit tricky. I, I hate that system. I'm never taking one out again, or at least not, not that kind. But there's still a lot of people who really like it for some strange reason. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so how did you solve this issue then in, in the end? Did you sell the, the farmhouse or... Uh... Well, first I paid off a lot of money. So every then I sold something on eBay, for example, and every cent went to the mortgage. Yeah. Uh, then I uh, tried to uh, change it a bit. So I, I got it from 100% at the bank to uh, about 50% at the bank and 50% with some sort of family bank construction, uh, which saved me a lot of uh, interest because the interest on the family bank construction was a bit lower since... Mm-hmm. We were like five years later, so the interest went down. And the bank wouldn't have a surcharge anymore because I wasn't financing about 100% through them. Yes. So that helped me, like restructuring the mortgage. Mm-hmm. And I think I went down from about 2,500 euros just in mortgage to 1,500. Okay, that makes a huge difference. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was the changes and I paid off about 70,000 euros in, I think, three years. So I uh, removed the, that savings mortgage, which meant that everything I saved up until then uh, I could pay off. So that, that saved a huge amount of money. And then, uh, well, I I hit this spot where I was just fine as it was. I was still paying off, but it was also very doable. And, and then I met my now husband, who is very not a farmhouse person. <laughs> so after about, uh, I think, two years, I moved in with him and I, I sold the farmhouse. But it was more of a, because I did I paid that, down the mortgage that much and I saved so much money uh, on daily stuff to pay off the mortgage. Mm-hmm. That was actually the only way w- how I could save the farmhouse or sell the farmhouse without being in massive debt. Because... I sold it for less than I bought it for. Uh, I did the entire renovation from my own money, so bit by bit and piece by piece, and that money was all gone. Oh, okay. I see. And, and how did that work on the on your mindset? So you you gained this new uh, money mindset through reading blogs, etc. To th- or I, w- I would say thanks <laughs> to this situation <laughs> or uh, uh, what, yeah. what what changed in your mind actually? Where did you so you started with an I mean, let's say an average Joe mind, money mindset. You did what everybody was doing. 
and then you start to reading and then you you start to acquire new insights how, how does that work yeah I, I was just doing the well like reading all the financial stuff and uh I just wanted to stay afloat, but I also wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be this vulnerable again. So um, one of the one of the things I learned was how important mindset was, because if you are saving and you're not spending that much money, it's kind of nice to focus a bit on minimalism, for example, because that, that shows that uh, buying no stuff is also very good because it, it will help you get more space, it will save you money, it will make you more of a content person. So I learned about the mindset part and then I started to apply it to the money uh, yeah. thing because saving and with with saving I meant I mean mostly not spending that much money because I didn't have that much money to spend then but I still didn't want to f- to focus on scarcity and about I didn't want to focus on not having the money to spend I just wanted to be in a place where I didn't want to spend it and not because of the money but because I was just happy with what I had yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. I um, I had that same feeling when I was uh, actually in my best financial situation when I was an expat uh, uh, three years ago. And, and I had this thing that, okay, I was making a bit more money than now when I was, I mean, I was sent abroad so to France, to Paris, and my apartment was paid and a lot of expenses were paid because the company sent me then. And it was great financially because then, yeah, I had everything I wanted and I had more money, etc. I was good. I was in a great place. And uh, and the thing is, I had all this money and I could use on buying stuff. For example, uh, I don't know what, clothing or partying or whatever, uh, dr- drinking fancy champagne or, <laughs> you know, I could go to, to some nice places, some nice restaurants in Paris, for example, in the evenings. But it's not something I did. I mean, I did sometimes, but... I didn't go every night or didn't buy a new uh, pair of jeans every month or every week. I just bought what I wanted, just what I needed. I'm not that I'm a pure minimalistic person, but I had I was in this phase where I was content. I was like, I, I don't yeah. I don't need I don't feel the need to buy stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not about not having the money to buy it, yeah. or uh, it, it's it's about just being content with what you want or with what you have. And not feeling the need to, to buy stuff because people also often feel the need to buy stuff to make them feel happy. For example, because they don't have a lot of money, then they feel the need to treat themselves, mm-hmm. which results in, well, again, money problems. But if you're just happy with what you have, and it's it's just easier to do that if you have the right mindset, then you don't need to spend the money. And that, that becomes the point where you, uh, you're you kind of touching upon that abundance part when you can just feel rich with whatever you have and then money is is no longer like a, a very important thing it's there but it's it's a tool so you can use it if maybe i don't know what you did with your money back then in paris but when i moved in with my uh, husband i also saved a lot of money of course and then i started to think well uh, maybe i want to try investing now because previously i felt i didn't have the money to do it and now i'm learning a lot about it and um uh, I'm loving it. And I also saved up uh, a year of expenses so I would be able to uh, work on the money mindset part and about on how I can teach other people to do it. So I used to do translations for people about the most boring subjects and writing SEO texts for people. And now I thought, well, if I save up like one year of expenses, which isn't that much because, uh, well, I, I don't spend a lot of money, then I can just try to uh, see how it feels if, if I can make my days like my perfect day. So spend them the way I want, uh, work from home, uh, learning a lot of things, going to every event I want to, uh, creating my own things and seeing if I can help people with that. So that, that gives such a lot of freedom and it would only have been, po- it wouldn't have been possible even if I moved to a cheaper house if I was still pay, uh, buying new jeans every month or going to cafes every night, I, I would still not be able to do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. very good. And uh, I mean, in my case, when I was in this phase, I was in an abundant phase, as you say. Yeah. And I was content. And actually, the thing is, my heart started to invest a bit before, but okay, not super, super actively. And actually, with this, with this kind of let's say brain freedom or something or mindset freedom. Mm-hmm. 
I started to to look at to the opportunities like okay but okay I get this extra money instead of spending it on uh, on fancy restaurants uh, too much I mean I like fancy restaurants but only uh, yeah um, scattered through the year it has to be special of course it has to be special exactly yeah. so I like those things but okay I have this extra money now what do I do with it and this is how I started to read about blogs and podcasts and, and YouTube's uh, videos on money and how to use it this extra money to the best and then actually this is how i started my my blog actually so it's oh. it's thanks to this abundance situation actually yeah and i'm not sure if you recognize it but uh, i also felt like investing if you're just starting out and maybe that's different for men or women but it, it can be kind of scary because uh well i think everyone knows someone who lost a lot of money uh investing uh, but but if you have more of that that freedom of mind as you just called it, then um, it doesn't matter if you lose a little bit, and you're also not really focusing on making a profit in uh, short term, or at least I, I'm not doing. I I started reading about it. I started finding out more about the buy and hold strategy, uh, about uh, just like boring investing like index funds. Index, yes, <laughs> but that works great. Mm -hmm. And when everything goes down, which has happened a few times now, uh, not really that terribly, but a little bit, then I usually, if, if I didn't have any money or if I was still in the scarcity mindset, I would have freaked out, sold everything. I would have made my loss real because then I wouldn't, it wouldn't go up if, if I sold my stocks or if I s sold everything. But now I just kept it there and well, then it goes green again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. And, uh, I don't know. Well, I think it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. I think it's about knowledge as well. And okay, probably women uh, have a different views. And actually, before reading much into the um, into the finance blogs, etc. Okay, I, I had some money in the stock exchange, but I was not really, you know, I put it there and I said, look, uh, let's see how it goes. I have some ideas, but I'm not, even though I have a financial background, I'm not experienced with stocks and finance. So, I mean, with stocks. So I um, I put it there with the the idea that well if it goes down twenty percent okay it's money I don't need tomorrow so let's see how it goes let's try to learn by doing this is how I usually roll and um, okay but then after reading more blogs etc then I learned more about the really more details and like index funds or boring investing and uh, the risks and more like yeah the the historical trends of the stock markets. So then I felt even more confident to to invest more and then to adapt my strategy because in the beginning I did some stupid mistakes. I bought some penny stocks uh, thinking yeah. they will they will Same 10x, here. 10x or I, I you know was kind of trading a little bit uh, but okay it was I was losing more in fees than I was gaining in uh, in capital gains. So I did this and then back just a little remark because you you're a woman investing and it seems that and I've read a few articles about this that Women are better investors than men. And I, and I can totally agree with the article because it says men are more bold. They try to be more aggressive and trade more. And, you know, they want to, they want to show off kind of. And then women are more conservative. They try to pick the right index fund or the right stocks and keep it. And they're not so much into the, the active trading or uh, try to impress others. They, they really, they seem to be more diligent. And I've seen that in a few articles. So... Congratulations yeah. to all the women who invest. You're better than uh, you're probably better than uh, your male peers. Well, uh, yeah. Well, you can just lose a lot of money in transaction fees. So mm -hmm. if you're doing a lot of transactions, then, well, as a result, you can lose a lot of money, which really adds up if if you look at it, at it from a long term perspective. Yeah. And I'm, I I read the articles as well, and they have this great book in in Holland about it, which shows it um, uh, with, with uh, examples, and it's all about not that the woman is woman is that's much more smarter but uh well that she doesn't trade that much and exactly as you say she doesn't want to show off she's just picking some things and sticking with it and that that just really helps yeah. but i made the same mistakes as you in the beginning <laughs> yeah, i didn't read about uh, it yeah i saw yeah. this play money so i didn't put too much you know I, it was less than 500 euros so so it's okay you know just experimenting trying to see how it works the website blah 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 so yeah. that's fine that's fine absolutely and uh, Adina, actually, so we are talking about all this. And then is this something you also um, uh, discuss in your uh, Money Mindset Academy? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. I have uh, some courses on investing and uh, on money mindset in general, but also on budgeting, because if you don't know where your money is going, then you, it, it's, it's just nice to know where it's going. So you can just leave that uh, be and do with the rest what you want. Mm -hmm. So it has 15 courses currently, and I will add one every three months. So oh, wow. okay. there's enough for everyone. Okay, and it's in Dutch. Uh... It's, only in, it's, it's only in Dutch. Okay, well, yeah, I was going to ask, yeah, it's only in Dutch, but is there a, an English version coming or? A... Uh, I think so. I'm not sure if it will be the same, but uh, I will, uh, next year, I will develop some sort of, uh, at least a money mindset course for my average to awesome website. Mm -hmm. So that will be uh, due in 2020. Oh, very good. Exciting. Exciting. I'm uh... I'm looking forward to it and I will uh, definitely share it uh, here in the show notes. Awesome. So please uh, yeah, just send me a, a message when you when it's ready and I'll uh, link it up uh, to this uh, show notes. Excellent. And Nadine, yeah, well, one thing I wanted to say about investing in stocks is that um, to be successful, you don't need to be smart. Huh? I mean, people think it's uh, sometimes, yeah, but it's too complicated, etc. And I mean, you don't need to have a PhD in uh, finance or be a doctor or be a Warren Buffett. Huh? You, no. I think investing in the stock markets is is for everybody. Yeah, it is. It, it, there were a few things that helped me. It was seeing the the history of the market, so that it goes up and down, and that from like the 1900s up until now, it's always gone up, just with a few uh, ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And the, the the idea that you don't have to look at the papers all the time, but that you can just uh, go with the, the index market and save on costs, which is also combined with the index funds because they are much cheaper than if you uh, pay someone else to, well, create some sort of beleggingsfonds. Can you know what that? Uh, yeah, mutual funds, investing funds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, index fund is more uh, is is cheaper than a mutual fund. So. Uh, those three things were actually what helped me a lot in investing. So it's just buy something at low cost and don't do anything with it. Don't freak out. And if the market drops, then it's uh, it's sale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the time to buy. That's the time to buy. But of course, you need to do just the research and see if it's something that will grow up in the future or if it's really a drop. So, but if you're confident in what you're buying and you know it's a, just a market trend, then okay, you, you will just buy more indeed. Yeah, and just to find uh, whatever you want to buy, I I just checked out a lot of uh, financial independence blogs and there were some funds that, that were bought by almost everyone uh, because of the low cost. And those people are really getting into it and they're really reading everything about it. So at a certain point, you just have to, or at least I just trust uh, their research because they they are doing it for themselves and not not for for the bank. So yeah, I just yeah. I just started out there and that made it actually very easy to find something uh, to invest in. Yeah, and what about uh, your property now? Do you did you buy a house with your uh, with your husband? Yeah, he he already had the house. Okay, and, uh, but only for about a year. So when we got married, we uh, it became my house as well, mm -hmm. and we are paying off the mortgage. We can do ten percent. Uh, per year as a maximum uh, if we do more we have to pay a fine so we are doing the 10% we've been doing that for about four years now I think mm -hmm. and it's not the same type of agreement as you had the, with the farmhouse huh? no no <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying that this is a smartphone but I didn't take this one out so <laughs> I would have negotiated a, low, a higher uh, um, rate to uh, uh, to pay down, so he can only pay down ten percent. I would prefer it if, well, twenty percent or, or something, because that would mean that you could pay it off in five years, and now it be ten years. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Adina, this was uh, great. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to you about uh, mindset, about money mindset, etc. And your story. Thanks for sharing. And Adina, before we head off, we always have uh, three quick fire questions on the show. And the number one question is, what has been your best investment so far? Uh, I thought about it, of course. And I think that would be the NLP course I took about six years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the time, I was really into saving money, paying off the mortgage, trying to create more freedom in my life. 
And um, that course really gave me insight into how important mindset is for everything. So the money mindset, but also mindset in general. Like you can see a situation, a situation is neutral, but the way you perceive it can be different from how someone else perceives it. And the way you perceive it does determine how you feel about it and mostly also what you do about it. So uh, I've done much better courses after that one, but I think that one really was some sort of catalyst for everything in well in my uh development yeah and nlp stands for neurolinguistic programming right yes yes okay very good and what is your favorite book uh, that you would recommend to anyone and it does not need to be financial well i read about 100 books a year so i don't really 100. have one <laughs> yeah i don't really have one all-time favorite and they're not all personal development books or something, but also novels and stuff. But I'm reading one now and I really like it because uh, it's it's called Money, A Love Story and it's by Kate Northrup. And she does a really good job of explaining why money mindset is so important. Mm -hmm. And what I also really like about it is that she debunks a lot of myth, myth about why money would be evil or why having money would make you a bad person. So it's really going into the money mindset and it really hits on the well, a kind of all limiting beliefs you might have about money, even if you didn't know them. So I really like that book and I would really recommend it. Okay, sounds good. And uh, Adino, what is the best purchase uh, you could recommend for a hundred, for less than a hundred euros? Well, that's also one I had to think about because as we discussed, I don't spend a lot of money on <laughs> stuff. Yeah. But I think I would go for my soft box set because um, I bought it after FinCon 2018. I was totally inspired to do videos after that. But um, doing videos is a bit out of my comfort zone. So I just found many reasons not to do it. And one of my favorite reasons uh, was the light is bad. It's too dark now. Let's do it later today mm -hmm. uh, or maybe tomorrow. And well, you're from Belgium, Luxembourg, you know, probably no Dutch winters. There's not that much light anyway. So I would do maybe one video a month and then postpone it to next month. So I got this soft box set and it gives you enough light and it also makes you look very good. But um, you already look very good, Adina. Come on. Yeah, because of the, because <laughs> of the soft light. Yeah. So I really love it because it, it, it helps. Well, it, it's nice if you're... Um, well, if you can do like the videos all the time and you don't have to wait until the light is good or uh, I also use it to make pictures for my blog and it just helps me uh, not having to do it at a specific time frame because I usually forget. I, I I have no idea what time it is right now. I, I think if I try hard, I know what day it is, but I'm just not very good with time. So having something like that will help me do things whenever I want for my blog, for my website. And yeah, I really love it. So I got two with the background. I usually just use one. And I think it was 99 euros. Oh, perfect. A hundred under a hundred euros. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Through Amazon. So yeah, f for bloggers, it's really great. Okay. Excellent. And I know that even, you know, I have a friend, he's a, uh, he started to listen to the show and he wants to do kind of videos and stuff for his job, actually, because he's an entrepreneur and not in the in a blogging style, but just to present his product or to present some uh, some of the products. Just so and so that's interesting for those people as well. I think. Yeah, it's 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 just very useful. Even if you just want to take pictures, uh, product pictures or uh, pictures of whatever, it just helps if you have something uh, that gives a lot of light, but it doesn't uh, reflect like the light bulb. Because yeah, if yeah. you're doing like an image with a regular uh, well, with a cell phone camera or with a regular uh, camera, you might get a reflection. But those those boxes are really great for that. And they're not that expensive because I got the set. But if I think if you buy one, it will be much cheaper. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And Adina, so where can the people uh, learn more about you? Uh, well, they can, if they want to brush up their Dutch, they can go to... <laughs> Lekkerlevenbetminder.nl. I do have an English website, which is average to awesome.com with the dashes between average and two and two and awesome. So average dash to dash awesome.com. Uh, I do have to update that, to be honest. Well, you can just uh, hit me up on Instagram. That's also fine. Or send me a message through my contact page or anything. 
Okay, very good. I'll uh, link it all up in the show notes. And uh, when when your uh, Money Mindset Academy is in English, just drop me a line and then uh, I'll link it uh, as well. So that's uh, great. So everybody can participate. That's yeah. Uh, excellent. Awesome. Excellent. Okay, very good. So Adina, thank you very much for uh, taking this early call today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I'll uh, speak to you soon. Yeah, speak to you later. Really enjoyed this conversation with Adina and indeed developing a right, the correct money mindset is crucial to um, be successful with your finances. And it is not only applicable to money. It can be to you for your work, for your business, for your love life, whatever. You know, starting with your mindset is crucial in any undertaking. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you learned something from it. I certainly did. And here are my key takeaways. Your money mindset is your attitude towards your finances. These are typically scarcity mindset. There is never enough. You're afraid that money will run out or an abundance mindset. You're in a place where you're content and there will be, there will always be enough money. Here are some examples. Scarcity, saving for the sake of saving. And that is the wrong focus. Actually, money should be a tool, not a goal as such. Abundance, money's like air. I really like that image. You should be able to breathe it in and out. You never think, it's, and it's true what Adin said, when you walk around the, in the street, you never think of air running out. It, it's just there and you, you don't think of it. So I really like that. The second takeaway, to get started with developing your mindset, start with getting to the why. So ask yourself why you save money, dig into your money memories and experiences, and you will be off to a great start to find out more details about your, the money stories you're telling yourself, the limiting beliefs, etc., So this is how uh, Adina takes her student on to their journey to find out more about their limiting beliefs about money, etc. The third key takeaway regarding Adina's money mindset, when she was struggling with her uh, the repayment of her mortgage with that uh, sneaky system, <laughs> she uh, got educated about uh, finances, mortgages, uh, money uh, through books, blogs, writing about it, trying to connect with people in the blogosphere. And uh, yeah, she, she mentioned that she focused on minimalism at first and then applied that concept to money. This means, for example, for you to focus on contentment, be happy with what you have. Focusing on what you have instead of what you do not have is a great place to start and uh, focusing on the right thing, on uh, developing that abundance mindset. Number four, with regards to mortgages and any type of loans in general, Yeah, when you get the contract, read the fine print and understand what you're getting into. And last but not least, well, this might be a surprise to you, uh, but indeed it is true that uh, apparently I've read it uh, several times, but yeah, indeed women seem more diligent than men when it comes to investing. <laughs> so that was it for today. Thank you so much for listening. It really means a lot to me. Make sure you subscribe in Apple Podcast. And of course, Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or feedback. Send me an email john at johnnytalks.com or connect through social media at johnnytalks on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And amigos, once more, thanks so much for listening and I'll speak to you next time.